The following program has been edited down from its original length and comes from the DVD, The Heavens Declare, Origin of the Universe. Visit us today to obtain the whole program. Well, in the big picture, everybody asks questions about uh, where we are in the universe, how we fit in, where we came from, where we're going. Why am I here? What's What's this all about? You're not human if you don't ask these kind of questions. Either the universe came from nothing or from some other universe where it was created. To buy into the Big Bang, you have to sell out in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. If we're just glorified goo, then I would, there's not much meaning to that. Conversely, if we were created specifically in the image of God, then that has major implications for each of us. The stars, the universe, our solar system, where did it come from and why are we here? These are topics that stir the imagination. Were we created by God or did we evolve over millions of years through slow and gradual processes? Can we know for sure? Well, in the big picture, everybody asks questions about uh, where we are in the universe, uh, how big the universe is, how we fit in, uh, where we came from, where we're going. Why am I here? What's, what's this all about? And why didn't anyone give me instructions? You're not human if you don't ask these kind of questions about the ultimate destiny, origin and of the universe and origin of ourselves. I think probably everyone has feelings like that, especially as a child. We get a lot of our ideas from the ancient Greeks. Uh, we really trace our lineage of history of science back to them. And since much of their science dealt with astronomy, it, uh, the history of astronomy is really rich in this sort of thing. And many of them believed in the eternality of the universe. They thought the universe had always existed. Now, I think that there are really a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one of them, they, they couldn't conceive of a natural or physical way that the universe could come into existence by itself. And the other thing was the fact that they didn't have sufficient gods that could do this. Their gods were not much more than Superman. You know, you had uh, Zeus and others, and they, they really had foibles like humans did. They were born, they could die. They were not transcendent gods, so they weren't creator gods. They were bound by the creation, just as humanity is bound by the creation. It's interesting to me that that idea of the eternality of the universe persisted well into the 20th century. And that really was the common view up until about the time of uh, Tycho, or 1500s, 1600s, around there, when people started to recognize that things like comets, which they used to think were atmospheric phenomena, they used to think those were part of Earth's atmosphere, they realized those are in space and the universe really can change. Astronomy took a giant step forward in the 16 and 1700s with scientists who believed in the Bible. Men like Galileo, Newton, Kepler, Bacon, and Pascal held to the belief that the universe was created by God, as presented in the book of Genesis. They believed God wanted them to discover His creation. Science was taken to new heights because of their biblical worldview, but their leadership didn't last long. A sinister plan was laid out to strip God from the credit of His creation. The Enlightenment, uh, they decided that man was the measure, man was important, and they went and take, took a look at the things that uh, uh, people had done in, in science in the previous century and even in the uh, 18th century, and uh, sort of claimed it as their own. It was a philosophical uh, point, it was not uh, actually even scientific. They hijacked it from start to finish, and took it away from its biblical foundation, and we're still recovering from that. We went from a situation where God was welcome, not only was welcome, but he was, he was central, to the point now that God is very unwelcome in the science that we do. 
It wasn't really, though, until the 1920s when astronomers discovered that galaxies are all moving away from each other, the universe appears to be expanding. That demolished the ancient view that the universe was eternal and static and unchanging. In a way, it confirms scripture. The Bible talks about this expansion of the universe in places like Isaiah 40, 22, where it talks about God stretching out the heavens as a tent. And so that just demolished the, these ancient ideas of an eternal and unchanging universe. But the discovery of the expansion of the universe didn't draw people back to the Creator God, but instead spawned new naturalistic ideas. It's interesting, in my lifetime, the uh, theories of the origin of the universe have changed quite a bit. Uh, when I was very young, there were two dominant ideas, what we call the Big Bang cosmology, we should say Big Bang cosmogony, but everybody used the word cosmology instead. And the other one was what we call the steady state. The science media will say all scientists believe the Big Bang. Well, that's not true. Number one, many scientists are Christians who don't accept the Big Bang. Even among non-Christian scientists, there are alternatives within the Big Bang. There are different versions of it. And there are also those who reject the Big Bang completely and propose alternate cosmologies. The Big Bang Theory, it's, uh, it's very elegant. It does have unanswered questions, but it's very intellectually satisfying to uh, many uh, astronomers. The idea was the universe began in an ultra-dense, ultra-hot state, and now they'd say 13.8 billion uh, years ago, as of last week, week four, I think. It's been expanding ever since and cooling, and out of this came everything. There are a few renegades out there who believe in a modified steady-state model. Uh, that's sort of been taken over by people who believe in plasma, what we call plasma universe or plasma cosmology. Then we have uh, recent creationists, uh, and myself included, who believe in uh, the Bible. Uh, we believe the creation was a few thousand years ago, not billions of years ago. And right away we run into problems with the Big Bang because it's uh, billions of years ago and you have the Earth existing, uh, well, coming into being about nine billion years into the process, kind of a Johnny come lately. There are a host of problems between the biblical account of creation uh, and the Big Bang. To buy into the Big Bang, you have to sell out in Genesis chapter one and two. You have to say that the, those, that story is, is, is just a story and is metaphor or, or non-reality. Recent creationists, as myself, generally reject uh, the Big Bang in favor of a, a recent creation model. It's kind of like a singularity. Uh, the Big Bang is a singularity, but we think the beginning of the universe probably was too. It's just much more recent. Either the universe came from nothing or from some other universe, or it was created by God. Those really are the only two logical possibilities. How do we evaluate which of these two is correct? One way is we could examine the logical consequences of those two views. In a naturalistic worldview, certain logical consequences follow from that. If biblical creation is true, certain logical consequences follow from that. And my argument for the Bible has always been that only the biblical worldview, one where God has created the universe, can make sense of those things that we take for granted, like the basic reliability of our senses, or the fact that the universe has an orderliness to it, uh, that makes sense if God upholds it by the word of his power. If on the other hand the universe is a cosmic accident, why would there be laws of nature? Why would they obey nice neat little equations like E equals MC squared and F equals MA and so on? We take those things for granted, but only in a creation worldview would those things make sense. The creation worldview is demonstrated to be true because if it weren't, you couldn't prove that anything is true. But we believe the Earth was created at the very beginning and did not come about after a long process in the universe. Our viewpoint differs very radically from what many scientists believe today. Creationists, uh, most of them have been evolutionists just like I was. I was an atheist, an evolutionist, and I believed in the billions of years that were alleged for the age of the world. When I became a creationist, I was convinced by the scientific evidence that there was no evolution and uh, billions of years didn't happen. 
So I changed glasses, I changed worldviews. So most creationists are like that. They have seen the world through at least two pairs of glasses. And so creationists are much more conscious of how worldview affects your interpretation. Creationists know how evolutionists think, having been that way ourselves, but most evolutionists don't really understand how creationists think. I would argue that the Christian worldview alone is the only philosophy that is self-consistent and will make knowledge possible. Any other philosophy ultimately will lead to contradictions. It will end up refuting itself. And that's something that the Bible tells us in Proverbs 1.7. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The scriptures make clear you either start with biblical presuppositions, a God-honoring biblical worldview, or you're reduced to foolishness. I take as one of my primary assumptions that uh, God exists, that He's real, that He's revealed Himself through His Word to us, the, the, the Bible. The Christian worldview can make sense of those assumptions. Of course my senses are going to be basically reliable if God created them. Of course that makes sense. On the other hand, evolution cannot make sense of those basic assumptions that we all take for granted. If evolution were true, then why would my senses be basically reliable? If they're just the results of, you know, rearranged pond scum, why would, why would we expect them to be reliable? And so the Christian worldview can make sense of those basic, what we call presuppositions, your most basic assumptions about reality, and secular worldviews really can't. Evolutionists, most of them, uh, have only seen the world through evolutionary glasses. Every scientist does this. You establish a set of worldviews about how you think things work and have worked and how we got here. And then you uh, try to funnel all the data you get into that framework. The evolutionist is not conscious most of the time that he is viewing the world this way, that his worldview is shaping how he interprets data. And if you have data that doesn't fit the worldview very much, you kind of push it aside. If you assume that the universe has been here a very long time, then you're going to be interpreting evidence in that way. You'll assume that all fossil layers were laid down at today's very slow rate. And so you'll look at the, the Grand Canyon and see miles of fossil layers, and you'll say, well, that took a long time to deposit. Of course, nothing like the Genesis flood could have deposited them. So the worldview assumption that the Earth is very old shapes uh, one's view about how the layers in the Grand Canyon got deposited. Choosing between the two is not simply a matter of looking at data and saying, where does the evidence go? Because there's spiritual implications. We are at heart all sinners and we are rebellious against our Creator. I fought that for a long time, even though I saw data, I saw science. No, 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 because of where it leads to. It leads to me having accountability. But I think a lot of the rejection of Christianity comes from that. There's an atheist philosopher, I think it was uh, Nagel, who, who mentioned something along the lines of, I don't want the universe to be that way. So that sort of sums it all up. This program is brought to you by Awesome Science Media, an organization committed to producing high-quality science-focused television content, all from a biblical worldview. Be sure to sign up for our email newsletter to find out about our new titles and get deals on our content. To learn more about who we are, visit our website and online store at awesomesciencemedia.com. You can now get access to all of our programming on our video-on-demand platform at AwesomeSciTV.com with a low monthly subscription rate of $4.99. And for a limited time, the first seven days are free, so you can check us out before you commit. Subscribe today and get access to every episode and documentary we have produced. Not only will you get access to all of our programs, but every behind-the-scenes video, blooper reels, interview clips, scientist testimony, producer video blog, on-site production previews, and spherical production videos. Awesome Sci TV will also be the place where we release our newest content, so you'll be the first in the world to see our newest episodes and documentaries. We're always producing content, so new titles will be added as soon as we release them. No matter where you live on the globe, if you have internet, you can subscribe to Awesome Sci TV. 
So what are you waiting for? Check us out today. Sign up for a seven-day trial. You'll have the choice to sign up for our monthly package or save money by signing up for our yearly subscription. But if you don't want to subscribe, Awesome Sci TV also offers each title for rent or for purchase. View our content from our website or download it to your computer or mobile device when you purchase it. It's easy to access any of our titles. Get all of our great programming and build up your faith in God's Word. Remember, for a limited time, you can sign up for a seven-day free trial. Go to AwesomeSciTV.com to sign up now. The difficulty in deciding what happened in the past is you're not able to directly observe this. We frequently make this distinction between what we call operational science and historical science. The evolutionists don't like that, but I, it's okay. It's still a valid thing to point out. And astronomy is difficult because we can't bring things into the laboratory and do experiments. I mean, you can't bring a star into your lab bench and play with it. There's also, with few exceptions, we haven't visited these objects either. I mean, we visited a few planets with a few spacecraft, and that's about it. So for the most part, we're taking pictures of objects from very far away and trying to figure out, A, what they're doing today, and B, what they were like in the past. There's a scripture in Ecclesiastes that Gerald Ardsman used to like to quote, what has happened is remote and exceedingly distant. Who can understand it? We are talking about things that we can't lay hold of. We don't have a nice time machine. Um, we can't go back and see what happened and record what happened. So we have to look at the evidence left by all the events that happened and there are different ways to interpret that evidence and your presuppositions get into that uh, interpretation very strongly. So there's assumptions you have to make in order to do that and part of the difficulty is that in a lot of these cases there's a lot of possible past scenarios that would still produce the same result we see today. How do you know which of those past scenarios is correct? We have to make a lot of assumptions in order to do that and there's no way to verify those assumptions. Your assumptions might be wrong, your conclusions might be wrong. How do you know? They all produce the same effect, which is what we see in space today. Many times people uh, say, well, disbelieving evolution is like disbelieving gravity. We can test any theory of gravity. In fact, general theory of relativity is being tested all the time in all sorts of experiments and doing quite well, that. thank you. If somebody comes up with, a, with, a, with an alternate, say, I don't believe the, the theory of gravity we have, here's a better theory, then we can build a piece of equipment, we can go into a lab, we can put something, spacecraft, in orbit, whatever we can do, we can do some sort of experiment to test this. Creation or evolution, that is a past process. How can you devise an experiment in the here and now that will allow you to find out what happened in the past to things, like, for instance, dinosaurs, what happened to them? That's a past process. Sort of like forensic science. You can never totally recreate a crime scene, uh, no matter how careful you are. Furthermore, who's to say that some other sort of explanation could suffice? That's the whole point of a criminal uh, case a trial many times, is that you've got the prosecution spinning one theory to explain all the details, and you've got the defense putting forth a different theory. And they both cannot be true. They both could be false, but they both can't be true simultaneously. And we're dealing with a past process. And there are many situations where people found out later that their interpretation of past processes, be in science or be in forensics, has been wrong. And so the standards of proof are not the same when you're talking about past processes and current processes. The way I like to illustrate this is with uh, the late Carl Sagan. Uh, over 30 years ago, he had a popular TV series on PBS, at that point the most popular, and for a number of years afterwards it was. And he had a statement very early on in that, in the book and in the video series, uh, the universe is all there is, all there ever has been, and all there ever will be. And many people hearing that or reading that say, wow, what a profound scientific statement. There's not a bit of science in this. He's asserted three things. First of all, the universe uh, is all that there is right now. It's a denial of a spiritual reality. It's a denial that God exists. He can't prove that, but it's what it is. Then he said that it's the only universe that uh, ever has existed. That means God has never existed or no, nothing outside of the natural or physical world has existed in the past. And it's all ever will exist. It's an assertion that, that the natural world is all there is and all ever will be. 
Well, how could Carl Sagan know that with any uh, certainty? Well, he'd have to be able to step outside of the world and look and see that there's nothing outside of the world. He'd have to also do it, not only do it now, but every time in the past and every time in the future. Well, obviously he couldn't do that because to do that you'd have to be God, which he has assumed doesn't exist. So it's an assertion of his worldview. There's no science in it. That's fine as long as you recognize it's his worldview. And that's the kind of thing totally opposite of what I'm talking about. He starts with that worldview, and so if he, if he concludes that God doesn't exist, I'm not surprised because he assumed to start out that God did not exist. He said, I don't see any evidence there, proof that God exists. Well, of course not. You're, you're not looking at it properly. You've also decided that science is uh, only dealing with the physical world, which it is, but if you don't believe the supernatural world exists, the spiritual world, then why would you expect to see physical, natural evidence of, of that beyond those things? You make that assumption and you end up with certain set of conclusions because of the assumptions that you've made. And it's very tough to get outside of either one of those boxes and view the world differently. Finding out how the universe was created is a challenge. We've seen how our worldview influences how we look at the data. But the observable evidence, like the stars, the planets, and the laws of physics should be able to tell us, right? Does it show a universe created by chance or one by design? I think there are things in the universe we see that can tell us about our origins. Uh, one thing I like to talk about is the, the, the first and second law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is a, is a conservation principle that uh, there's no more energy being made. Energy is neither created nor is it destroyed. We used to have the uh, conservation of mass. We still talk about that. Same sort of thing. That matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Now, we've discovered in the past century that that's uh, not quite true because, as Albert Einstein argued, I think in 1905, energy and mass are equivalent things. E equals mc squared gives you the equivalence there. So to modify that today, we would say that the total mass energy of the universe remains constant, neither created nor destroyed. Having clarified that, uh, that would seem to rule out that uh, the universe could have come into existence by itself. If you suddenly have the appearance of matter and energy, that would seem to violate the first law of thermodynamics, which is a very fundamental thing we see about the universe. But the second law has an interesting thing to say. It says the amount of usable energy out there is always diminishing. We have different ways of expressing it. By the way, the second law is a very slippery concept. Uh, just when I think I've got a hold of it, I, 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 I get mugged by something I didn't really know, realize before. But you can state it a number of different ways. One of the statements, again, is the usable energy gets less and less. The energy gets dispersed and less available to us. We call this entropy, and entropy is increasing. That's a measure of, of how much unusable energy there is or how much disorder there is in the universe. If you extrapolate that into the past, you'll find out that the universe in the past must have been very ordered. The energy must have been very useful. And if you go back and back and back into the past, you have a problem because you reach a point of infinite uh, order and infinite usefulness which doesn't exist today. So there's been a change from that. And how did it ever get started? So the first law by itself seems to suggest the universe did not have a beginning. And the second law argues that it must have had a beginning. So you've got these two very fundamental laws that seem to be universal that have this tremendous amount of tension. Both are true, but ultimately in the past, they couldn't have both been operating as they are today. And to me, that tells me there's an interruption of the way the world normally works. We have this world that seems to have universal law that seems to govern it. That would be the upholding of the world by the power of God's word. I believe that we're seeing the manifestation there. But ultimately, the two laws, to, when taken together, seem to indicate very strongly that the universe had a non-physical, non-natural sort of origin. And I think that argues very strongly for, for something, uh, how the world came to be, that we will never be able to probe because it's, it would violate physical principles to do that. And that, to me, indicates a supernatural origin.
there are various lines of evidence in the universe that lend themselves very naturally to a creation interpretation and are really sticking points for those who believe in a naturalistic origin. Hi, I'm Kyle Justice of Awesome Science Media. I'm glad you're watching our programs. I hope you've been ministered to. Some of you might feel called to give towards our ministry to help us produce even more great programming. I'm going to show you how. We've tried to be creative in the way we partner with our viewers, so we've set up a special producer's website just for you. Similar to crowdfunding, we have partnered with Patreon, a site that helps support us as content creators on a monthly basis. By giving, you become a producer with us. As a thank you for your support, we have set up several rewards depending upon how much you'd like to give. From exclusive access to extra content, a first look at our new programs, behind the scenes specials, to special one-on-one -on -one monthly hangouts with our hosts and experts. We want to thank you in some big ways. So here's how it works. Go to our website at awesomesciencemedia.com and select the special Become a Producer icon at the top. You can watch the introduction video first. Then on the right, you'll see various giving levels and what rewards you'll receive. Pick one and the website will lead you through the sign up process. Then more than once a month, you'll get email notifications when the rewards are available. You can even give as little as $1 a month. By becoming one of our producers, you'll be able to help us produce even more great programming every month. We'll reach the world with the message of our great creator. Thank you for your help and support. We look forward to partnering with you. When you study the origins of the universe, you begin to realize that each worldview has major implications. One brings meaninglessness, and one with great meaning. That you were created with a purpose. Which one will you choose? <laughs> Until next time, keep looking up and see that the heavens do declare the glory of God.